Mike, are you a Coke or a Pepsi man? At the risk of alienating some of our audience, Stephen, I will say that there is absolutely no question that I am a Coke man. Good. We agree. I don't drink soda very often, but when I do, it's a good old-fashioned Coke. Is that old-fashioned? Like, isn't this Coke that we've got a newer version of Coke or something like Didn't they change their recipe? We will get to that, but first we need to set the scene, and that scene, my friend, is war. That is right. The wonderfully named Cola Wars took place in the 1980s in the form of an increase in advertising and a marketing battle between Coca-Cola and PepsiCo for the hearts, minds, and dollars of thirsty consumers. Coca-Cola advertising had historically focused on wholesomeness and nostalgia for childhood, the American dream, that sort of thing. We've all seen the ads, the polar bears enjoying a nice cold Coke, or the Santa truck, right? Like the big truck of all the lights on it, with Santa refreshing himself as well between uh, sleigh rides with a glass bottle of Coke. Exactly. And this worked well for the company, but then in 1975, the Pepsi Challenge took place. The challenge originally took form of a single blind taste test. It was in malls and shopping centers, public locations all across the country. A Pepsi representative would come in, set up a table with two white cups, one containing a little drink of Pepsi and the other containing a little drink of Coca-Cola. Shoppers were encouraged to try both colas and then select which drink they preferred. Then the representative revealed the two bottles so the taster can see whether they preferred Coke or Pepsi. The results of the test showed Pepsi was preferred by more Americans. Now we should note that this testing method has come under some fire in recent years. In his book, Blink, The Power of Thinking Without Thinking, Malcolm Gladwell presents evidence that suggests Pepsi's success was a result of the flawed nature of a SIP test method. This doesn't hold up to rigorous scientific standards, Mike. His research shows that tasters will generally prefer the sweeter of two options based on a single SIP, even if they prefer a less sweet beverage over the course of an entire can or glass of of the beverage. And of course, as we all know, Pepsi is sweeter than Coke. Bingo. That this actually was one of the best advertising campaigns of all time. I think that it is a great idea and also created a huge change for Coca-Cola, which is kind of wild. But we'll get to that shortly. As we said, Pepsi wasn't yet done with Coke. In the late 1990s, Pepsi launched its longest term campaign that they have ever produced called Pepsi Stuff, which is just great. Uh, Consumers were invited to drink Pepsi get stuff and collect Pepsi points (laughs) on billions of packages and cups that they could then redeem for free Pepsi merchandise. And it worked. Tens of millions of consumers participated. Pepsi outperformed Coke during the summer of the 1996 Summer Olympics, held in Coke's hometown, where Coke was the lead sponsor of the Games. It's just, man, the Pepsi marketing team. It was a crack team over there. PepsiCo... However, ended up in court over the campaign because of a man named John Leonard of Seattle, Washington. John sent in a Pepsi stuff request with the maximum amount of points and a check for over $700,000. Now, why would you do that? That seems pretty peculiar, right? Well, according to the rules, it meant that he would be rewarded with a Harrier Jump Combat Aircraft. Pepsi (laughs) did... (laughs) (laughs) Pepsi did not accept the request, and Leonard filed a lawsuit. What a bummer. The judgment was that a reasonable person viewing the commercial would realize that Pepsi was not, in fact, offering a Harrier jet, which it said. It said if you gave them the maximum amount of points and a check for over $700,000 that they would reward you with a Harrier Jump aircraft. But this obviously was never going to happen. Everyone knew that you were not going to get a Harrier Jump jet. However, in response to the suit, Pepsi added the words just kidding under the portion of the commercial featuring the jet, <laughs> as, well, as well as changed the price to 700 million Pepsi Is points. the phrase just kidding legally binding? <laughs> Put it on everything. LOL, JK. That's what it would say to yeah. them. Yeah. So was Leonard just out to troll Pepsi? I mean, if you can write a check for 700 grand and sue a massive company, is it because you really thought you were getting an airplane or are you just bored? I think a little column A, a little column B, right? I, f- I figure you have the money, 
And then when they say they won't do it, you at least try and sue them because you may end up with even more money? I don't know. However, after the suit, things quietened down a little bit until the early 2000s when a little thing called the Internet opened up a new front in the war. Pepsi reintroduced Pepsi stuff in 2005, now based around a website, and Coca-Cola retaliated with Coke Rewards. Both companies partnered with the iTunes Music Store to give away songs to loyal soda buyers. And that's where we are today. Pepsi and Coke continue to battle it out in ads, giveaways, specials, and more. But there's a chapter of the story we skipped over, Mike. New Coke. More on that after this break. Make your next move with Squarespace. They let you easily create a website for your next idea. With the ability to grab a unique domain name, take advantage of award-winning templates, and have everything backed up with 24-7 customer support, they are the perfect place for your next site. Whether you want to create a store, a blog, a site for your business, maybe a site dedicated to the Cola Wars. No matter what it is, no matter what type of website you want to make, Squarespace has all the tools you need. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade. They are the all-in-one platform. Form. Just go to squarespace.com slash ungeniused, and when you sign up for a plan, use the code ungeniused for 10% off. Their plans start at $12 a month, but you can get that 10% off when you use the code ungeniused at checkout. So go to squarespace.com slash ungeniused and find out more today. Squarespace, make your next move, make your next website. Okay, so we need to rewind the clock a little bit to the, back to the mid-1980s. All right, so to set the scene, the Pepsi Challenge has swept the nation of America, and Pepsi is winning. Coke is now looking like an old product, one that is not fit for modern times. The Coca-Cola Corporation clearly doesn't want that. They want to be able to compete with Pepsi in the form of a new beverage, one that is sweeter and more akin to this, this, this taste that people seem to enjoy all of a sudden. One that can compete directly with the diet sodas that have swept into the market, a new beverage for a new generation mike doesn't that sound good let's do it let's go it does sound good you sound like you work for pepsi now to put some numbers to this after world war ii the market share for coca-cola was 60 percent by 1983 it had declined to less than 24 percent it's not great to make matters worse analysts believe that baby boomers were more likely to purchase diet drinks as they aged seeking drinks with fewer calories growth in the quote, full calorie soda market would have come from younger drinkers then. But at the time, they favored Pepsi by even more overwhelming margins than the market as a whole. Coke was in trouble. So in 1985, new Coke is put on the market. This did not go well. But before we get to the problems, we need to talk a little bit about the market research and customer surveys Coca-Cola did in the run up to launching this new product. In focus groups, most testers said they would buy and drink the product if it were Coca-Cola, although it would take some getting used to the change. About 10 to 12 percent of testers felt angry and alienated at the thought and said they may stop drinking Coke altogether. However, the company wrote these complaints off, but that would prove to be a mistake. I don't know why you would do the focus group testing if when most people said that they would need to get used to it. Like that you would then just not pay any attention to that. Like somebody telling you we will get used to your product isn't like, I don't know, it's not a glowing review. Anyway, another mistake with New Coke took place at the logistical level. Bottlers of Coca-Cola were still adjusting to Diet Coke and Cherry Coke and pushed back when the Coca-Cola company said that the new drink was going to be another new line of product. So they were going to introduce New Coke alongside their other products. That, coupled with the fear of a new variety of Coke in competition with the main variety that could have also cannibalized Coke's sales, led the company to replace the classic recipe with the new sweeter one. In hindsight, this seems also such a bad idea. So I can't believe they did this, right? But yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. And they jumped right in. Production of the original formulation stopped the same week that New Coke started shipping. There was no overlap. They just they just pulled the rug out from everybody. In many areas, New Coke was initially introduced in old Coke packaging as bottlers had to like use up the remaining cans, cartons, and labels before the corporation could get new packaging out into the field. Old cans containing new Coke were identified by their gold-colored tops, while glass and plastic bottles had red caps 
instead of silver and white. I'm not sure that's enough. That seems a little confusing. Eventually, stickers exclaiming new were put on cans and bottles, giving the product its name. The company held a press conference at New York City's Lincoln Center to introduce the new formula. Some in the crowd had been fed questions by Pepsi. Man, that marketing team is so good. Nevertheless, Coca-Cola CEO described the new flavor as bolder, rounder, and more harmonious. We all know what those words mean when it comes to beverages, I guess. And hailed the brand new product as an instant success. The company's stock went up on the announcement, and market research showed 80% of the American public was aware of the change within days. That's incredible for a time before the internet. The new formula was introduced with big marketing pushes in New York and Washington, D.C. In fact, workers renovating the Statue of Liberty were symbolically the first Americans given cans to take home. USA! USA. Sales figures from those cities and other areas where it had been introduced showed a reaction that went as the market research had predicted. In fact, Coke's sales were up 8% over the same period as the year before. The sugar rush wouldn't last, however. Many customers in the southern part of the U.S., my friends and neighbors, consider Coca-Cola a fundamental part of their regional identity. Remember the company's base in Georgia. And they were very vocal about their dislike of the change. Company headquarters began receiving letters and telephone calls expressing anger and deep disappointment. The company received over 40,000 calls and letters in just a short period of time. The Coca-Cola hotline received over 1,500 calls a day compared to around 400 before the change. When did we stop calling customer care lines hotlines? I don't know. It's, that's a word. When did that stop? That's a word I haven't heard in a while. <laughs> Like, is it like a hot online now? Like, because I guess a lot of that stuff's moved to the also, web. Also, when's the last time anyone wrote a letter to a company? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. A psych- it's all rage tweets now. I think so. A psychiatrist whom Coke had hired to listen in on calls told executives that some people sounded as if they were discussing the death of a family member. Oh, my. Yeah, it's not great, but I kind of understand it. And it's this, uh, this, this distaste soon spread past the South. Comedians and talk show hosts, including Johnny Carson and David Letterman, made jokes mocking the new drink. And even Fidel Castro, a longtime Coca-Cola drinker, contributed to the backlash, calling New Coke a sign of the American capitalist decadence. I mean, you could form that into some sort of logo for a Coke can. I think that would work. Yeah, sure. Gay Mullins, a Seattle retiree looking to start a public relations firm with $120,000 of borrowed money, formed the organization Old Cola Drinkers of America on May 28th to lobby Coca-Cola to either reintroduce the old formula or sell it to someone else. His organization eventually received over 60,000 phone calls. Pepsi-Cola took advantage of the situation, as any good company marketing department would, running ads in which a first-time Pepsi drinker exclaimed, Now I know why Coke did it. (laughs) Savage. (laughs) Despite the marketing push, however, Pepsi gained very few long-term converts over Coke Switch, despite a 14% sales increase in the same month over the previous year, which actually was the largest sales growth in company's history. So it's kind of like a short-term gain for the company, but not necessarily a long-term success. That didn't stop Roger Enrico, director of Pepsi's North American operations, from declaring a company-wide holiday and taking out a four-page ad in the New York Times proclaiming that Pepsi had won the Cola Wars. All of this was noticed by those inside the Coca-Cola Corporation. Sales were flat over the summer, and reports came in that American consumers were importing old Coke from other countries. Again, this is before the internet. You can't just go on Amazon or eBay and buy this stuff. You have to, I guess there's like a gray market for old Coke. The company tinkered with the recipe in June, but it just wasn't enough. Bottlers continued to complain with several holding a private meeting with company brass to discuss a boycott, despite an ongoing legal dispute over sugar prices. Coca-Cola executives announced the return to the original formula during the afternoon of July 11th, 1985, Just 78 days after New Coke's introduction. On the floor of the U.S. Senate, David Pryor called the reintroduction a, quote, meaningful moment in U.S. history. The New Coke formula, though, continued to be sold, and it retained the name Coca-Cola, with the original formula being sold as Coca-Cola Classic. 
Then, in 1992, New Coke became Coke 2, with the original recipe then reclaiming the Coca-Cola name. Complicated. It is complicated. Like, I, I had to read through that several times to understand what they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully, they had all the labels out in time when they switched it again. <laughs> You'd think this time that the bottlers were at least on board. I like. I kind of like this, that Coke ended up getting what they wanted, right? Where they wanted to have these two products available, but the bottlers said they didn't want to do it. Yeah. And then when the bottlers complained, it's like, well, your solution is to have all of the Coke available. Gay Mullins, the founder of that organization, Old Cola Drinkers of America... Are the drinkers old or is the cola old? It's confusing. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, anyways, Mullins was given the first case of Coca-Cola Classic. He truly won. By the end of the year, Coca-Cola Classic was substantially outselling both New Coke and Pepsi. Six months after the rollout, Coke sales had increased at more than twice the rate of Pepsi's. (laughs) Now, some of this is due to Cherry Coke's popular but uneven for rollout, but we all know what's at the heart of it. Coca-Cola Classic slowly pushed the soda formerly known as New Coke out of the market. In July 2002, the New Coke slash Coke 2 product was taken off the market completely. Now, I don't have any memory of this, so I'm assuming it never left America. I I don't remember it either. I don't know if I ever had it. Hmm. Maybe by the time that we were old enough to really pay attention, probably nobody was buying it. So like, you could get it, but not everywhere. Kind of like vanilla Coke. Right, like, you can get vanilla Coke, but it's not everywhere. Yeah, I, that's probably true. I just saw today peach Coke, which I was very upset about as, as, a, as an idea. That's not okay yeah. at all. <laughs> as you may have guessed it, the sudden reversal on new Coke has led to several rumors and conspiracy theories to try to explain how a company with the resources and experience of Coca-Cola could have made such an obvious and colossal mistake. The simplest... It's pretty straightforward and says the company intentionally changed the formula, hoping consumers would be upset with the company and demand the original formula to return, which would make sales spike. That seems too convenient. Like, that's what actually happened. And it's really risky. Like, what if they just get mad and never come back? It's an incredible <laughs> risk because it would, they would have done this at a time when they were the leaders and their competition was gaining on them. Like, yes, this is what happened. I don't think that it was what they tried to do. Now, the second main theory does have some truth to it. It says that New Coke's temporary reign covers the change from sugar sweet and Coke to much less expensive high fructose corn syrup, a theory that was supposedly given credence by the apparent different taste of Coke Classic when it then hit the market. In fact, though, Coca-Cola began allowing bottlers to remove up to half of the product's cane sugar as early as 1980, five years before the introduction of New Coke. By the time the new formula was introduced, most bottlers had already sweetened Coca-Cola entirely with high fructose corn syrup. So it is something there, but it's not why New Coke was a problem. And of course, you can still buy cane sugar Coca-Cola. It's really good. It's my favorite Coca-Cola. Um, I I don't drink a lot of... I love Coke, but I don't drink a lot of it anymore. Um, but I most of the Coke that I do have, I have when I'm in America and I get the like the real the real stuff. I think it comes from Mexico. So whenever I do have Coke here, where they use the corn syrup, it tastes way too sweet. I can't even finish a can anymore. So there's the last theory. It's the idea that it provided cover for the final removal of all cocoa derivatives from the product to placate the Drug Enforcement Administration. Now, this is like a a <laughs> whole thing. The DA was trying to eradicate the plant worldwide to combat an increase in cocaine usage. Coca-Cola did not include cocaine in the 1980s. But anyways, there's no evidence that even the plants even used in modern era Coke. Um, but the true recipe is a closely guarded secret. Yeah, so you you don't know, right? Maybe they were using coca. Maybe they still use it today. You have no idea because of this secret recipe. So as a side note, let me share something that we found on Wikipedia about this, about the secret recipe. According to Coca-Cola, only two employees are privy to the complete formula at any given time, and they are not permitted to travel together. When one dies, the other must choose a successor within the company and impart the secret to that person. The identity of the two employees in possession of the formula is itself a secret as well. Holy f***. 
<laughs> Indeed, my friend. This is serious. Like, you hear this thing about these secret recipes, and I had thought to myself, how do you do that today? Well, this is how you do it. You tell two people. That's how. That's amazing. If you want to read more about the Cola Wars, Pepsi Challenge, New Coke, there are a bunch of links in our show notes uh, in your podcast app you're listening to right now, or on the website, relay.fm slash ungenius slash 60. While you're there, you can send us an email with a topic suggestion, or you can do that on Twitter. The show is at ungenius. You can find Mike there as I-M-Y-K-E, and uh, you can find me as I-S-M-H. And until our next Cola War, Mike... Say goodbye. Pepsi sucks. Bye. (laughs) Adios.